Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is so nice to see everyone here today at First Baptist Church on this first Sunday. Yeah, today's Sunday. <laughs> Sunday in November. And good to see everybody on time since we turned our clocks back this morning. Um, and I'd like to welcome all those on Zoom and all those who will be watching in the future. Welcome and thank you. Um, we're going to start with a few announcements. First and foremost, the meeting after church, uh, the congregational meeting, has been postponed to a future date. He wrote down canceled here, but I know we're going to have one eventually. So it's postponed. Sorry, Jeremy. Um, tonight is the dinner at the Eagles that the Zion is putting on. It's for the community. It's a free dinner at the Eagles. Um, on Monday is Uplift at 3 o'clock here at church. It's, been, it's a reschedule from last Monday. Tuesday is our prayer group and book study. Uh, we are starting a new book. It's called When God Comes Down. We will be doing chapter 1. Thursday is the missions meeting at 4.30 p.m. with choir practice at 7. Uh, next Sunday is Mary and Martha breakfast and meeting at 8.30. And next Sunday, the shoe boxes are due back here at church. Is that correct? I assume? Okay, yep. So it is next Sunday. If you're doing a shoe box for the Operation Christmas Child, uh, please make sure that they are back by next week. Uh, upcoming events, November 14th, we are having a Share Your Faith potluck dinner here at church. As we begin the holiday season, let's take time to give thanks for each other and for our faith journeys. Come share your faith story and a dish. Happy birthday to Jerry today, by the way. Happy birthday. Uh, to Debbie Cam on Monday and Ray Koch on Wednesday. The flowers this morning are given by Peggy, Peggy Brockett in loving memory of her parents, Harvey and Dottie Brophy. Our word of preparation, um, the last time I was the assistant, we did the um, Beatitudes, um, no, the Paradoxal, that's right, we did the Paradoxal Commandments by Mother Teresa. So this time, we're going to be doing a uh, different twist on it for disabilities. Blessed are you who never bid us hurry up. Often we need time rather than help. Blessed are you who take time to listen. If we persevere, we can be understood. Blessed are you who ask for our help, for our greatest need is to be needed. Blessed are you who don't expect me to be saintly just because I am disabled. Blessed are you who understand that sometimes I am weak and not just lazy. Blessed are you who forget my disability if the body, the disability of the body, and see the shape of my soul. Blessed are you who see me as a whole person, not as a half or one of God's mistakes. Blessed are you who love me just as I am without wondering what I might have been like. And that's taken with deep appreciation from the poem Beatitudes for Disabled People by Marjorie Chapel. I can only imagine what it would be like when I walk by your side I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me I can only imagine I can 
can only imagine Surrounded by your glory What will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? To my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine I can only imagine Standing in the sun I can only imagine When all I will do Is forever Forever worship you I can only imagine I can only imagine Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 138, 1 through 3. Please join in reading the bold letters. I will give you thanks with all my heart. I will sing your praise before the heavenly beings. I will bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your constant love and truth. You have exalted your name and your promise above everything else. On the day I called you, you answered me. You increased strength within me. Lord,
Join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I can count a million times people asking me how I can raise you after all that I've gone through. The question still amazes me Can circumstances constantly change why forever
Lord God Almighty. Is the Lord God Almighty. Good morning. We are going to talk about this morning after I hand him his paraphernalia. <laughs> we are going to talk about the great banquet. It's one of the parables that Jesus teaches us so much in. And we're just going to touch on a few points about the great banquet when it has to do with the disabilities. But I wanted to just fill you in on where this comes in in the Bible. It's in Luke 14. And at the beginning of chapter 14, Jesus, on a Sabbath, important point there, goes to the Pharisee's home. And right away, he's met with an individual that's suffering from dropsy. Now, dropsy back then seemed to be a disorder that caused swelling all over the body, and it was especially noticed in the face. The face was kind of droopy. Because it was the Sabbath, and because he was in the home of basically the religious monkey monks, they thought they knew it all, he asked them, is it lawful to heal this man? He also, after he healed this man, pointed out that if an ox, or perhaps their son, which I think it's interesting that they put, he puts the same <laughs> examples as a valuable asset and a human being in the same thing. But he says, if they fell into a well, would you not get them out today? Got a point. I love that, that Jesus can just kind of hit home right away and that he was comfortable doing it in the home of Pharisees. Well, then be, right before we get to the example or the parable of the great banquet, he talks about where we're supposed to sit. And he shows that you shouldn't sit in the most honorable spot at the table because you might be asked to be moved down. But if you sit in the least recognized spot, there's hope that you'll be asked to move up. And before I started studying this chapter, that was something that I never really thought of. But of course, it's all leading up to the great banquet, which is basically a parable about how to live our Christian life. And before Ken reads his part, I want to read you verses 12 through something. I'm not sure where I'm stopping yet. <laughs> then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite friends, your brothers, or relatives, or your rich neighbor. If you do, they might invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The scripture passage is Luke 14, verses 15 through 24. After Jesus has finished speaking, one of the guests said, The greatest blessing of all is to be at the banquet in God's kingdom. Jesus told him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited a lot of guests. When the banquet was ready, he sent a servant to tell the guests, everything is ready, please come. One guest after another started making excuses. The first one said, 
I bought some land and I've got to look it over. Please excuse me. Another guest said, I bought five teams of oxen and I need to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another guest said, I've just now married and I can't, and I can't be there. The servant told his master what happened and the master became so angry he said, go as fast as you can to every street and alley in town. Bring in everyone who is poor and paralyzed and blind or lame. When the servant returned, he said, Master, I've done what you told me and there is still plenty of room for more people. His master then told him, go out along the back roads and make people come in. So my house will be full. Not one of the guests I first invited will get even a bite of my food. So let's talk a little bit more about the example that Jesus is giving us before we apply it to our own lives. Back in the time that Jesus was telling this story, it was customary for whoever was hosting a party to send somebody out ahead of time, all word of mouth, he would go around and it was basically like saving the date kind of thing that we do now. And he still needed, the person that was collecting the, you know, who's coming, still needed somewhat of a tally though because it determined what meat would be used that day whether it would be some type of bird, if it was fewer people, a bigger animal, and obviously several bigger animals if it was quite a few people. So it wasn't just for your information, it was information gathering for the host. Then, right as the food was almost completed, Another person would go around, and I'm assuming this must be just in the village, kind of like a village crier, and say that the dinner is ready. Please come join us. Well, as we could see here, there were three excuses just that he pointed out. One of them was if you purchased a piece of land, he had to go check his land out. Well, clearly, if you purchased land, you probably checked it out already. They didn't have a pandemic in his parable where you were buying things sight unseen or taking apartments sight unseen. And it was very interesting in the commentary that that type of excuse was very hurtful. The next excuse, I just bought five pairs of ox and I need to go try them out again. I think you would have already tested them out. Oxen were very important to people back in this time. They used it for several different things. And so it was more or less like our John Deere tractor today. You would definitely check it out before you purchased it. Finally, the, the wedding or the, I just got married so I can't go. Commentators seem to think that this is referring back to a time in Deuteronomy where it's excusing people from having any kind of military or civic duties for a year after they've been married. However, this exclusion does not include social obligations. Furthermore, Teresa's little take on it is, I would think a celebration would be incredible for someone that's newly married to be invited to a banquet. So when the person got back to the host and said, okay, these are who's coming. There's hardly any people filling that, that banquet hall and they have all this food prepared, now what? They couldn't just put it in the refrigerator or freeze it or give it away. So the host said, go out 
into the city and invite the poor, the lame, the blind. Basically what he was saying, the people that I wouldn't typically invite, please bring them in. They were highlighting the fact that these people were willing to come. Well, that still didn't fill up the banquet hall. So they were, went further out to the country lanes, and they make a point of this in the parable. And the significance of that is that that's referring to Gentiles, and that's not necessarily who the Pharisees would want to invite. So it's, it's kind of interesting how many layers, when you look at this parable, that we can see here. Thankfully, we do not live in biblical times, and gratefully, this still applies to us today. The great banquet is a metaphor for our Christian walk. We are invited to celebrate the fact that we follow Jesus. And it's important for us to invite others to do this as well, both individually and collectively as a church. And many people groups have used this parable to help invite a certain people group into their fellowship. And it does work to some extent, and of course there's always limitations. But I'm going to take that step today and say that it is a great metaphor for inviting those struggling with disabilities. Either they are affected by a disability directly or they're a caregiver of someone who's affected by a disability. We've been talking the last three weeks in Sunday school class about welcoming those with a disability and possibly understanding some of their perspectives and realities. If you think of someone in your life that is affected by a disability, and maybe it's someone that has never even thought about either coming to a church or it's too overwhelming or it just they're afraid of one more spot not fitting in. I just challenge you today to keep that person in mind as we go through some of these points and also pray for them. God will show you what he wants you to do. And one thing about Ken and I, with our ministry, Seek the Sun, is we're all about meeting people where they're at. We're not all about, you must do this or else. Because in my mind, that's not what God is asking us in any situation. He's asking us to respect one another, love one another, and help carry one another's burdens. He's not saying carry them completely on your own. So please keep that in mind. So what are some of the three like wowing moments that Teresa wants to share? The first one is, remember when you interact with an individual with a disability, whether they've just walked into this service today, or whether it's someone that you're getting to know every, at the place you go have coffee, or maybe filling up with gas, whatever the circumstances, just remember God saves, not you. And I mean this twofold. On the very basic level, you might see something that you feel would make that individual's life easier or more efficient. And I say go for it, share it, but remember they might not receive it very well. Or maybe they just want an interaction that has nothing to do with their disability. And so just remember that when you're in, you know, some type of interaction, if you see hesitation or you see just tension and, and you'll know it, you'll sense it, that they don't want to be changed. They just want to be accepted as they are. 
And that's one of the reasons I named my book Sayabona, because Sayabona is a Zulu term that means I accept all of you. And in many African tribes, this means that I accept your family, your animals, your how whatever. And that's the comfort for many people is just knowing that they're accepted at a very basic level. The other part of that God saves, not us, is sometimes we feel so compelled that we need to get the good words of Jesus totally to them that we scare them away. <laughs> because many times, and myself included, I don't know how many times without my permission, people have laid hand, hands on me that do not know me and try to heal me of my blindness. And yes, Teresa gets a little prickly. And mainly because I hurt for other people that possibly can't use their words to tell them back off. Or they feel like invaded. I don't feel any of those things. I just am very comfortable with my blindness. And oftentimes I'll say, well, since you want to pray for my healing, please pray for my hearing. Because that's what I'm not comfortable with. Or... I'll say something like that. It's not what you always expect. And it's a privilege to lay hands on someone and pray for healing. And you need to have a humble heart in order to do that. So just, just remember that there's not this sense of panic or, or fury. And, and we talked a lot about that among ourselves as leaders for Alpha. Whoever came in, it was a safe space spot to talk about spiritual issues and build the trust and I believe this happens with anybody regardless of whether they have a disability or they're rich or poor or their social class it doesn't matter you need to have a rapport in order to share Jesus and that leads me to the next point become part of the story Get to know them, whether it's just a hi at first, whether it's inviting them for a cup of coffee. If this is someone that you believe the Holy Spirit is prompting you to get to know more, don't hesitate to do that. Even if you have no idea what getting a coffee may look like for this person, they'll let you know. It's, it's all about just becoming part of the story and showing interest, allowing them to lo know more about you. And, and of course, this sounds so basic, like, duh. But sometimes I think we lose track of that. There's a, I'm trying to think of the word, there's a, a movement out in the, in the churches, and I, and I really love it. It's called Fresh Expressions. And many of you may have heard of this. Um, and it talks about church looking different. Church is not actually this building. Church is you and I. We're church. This building is just that. It's a building. And Fresh Expression says that this, this church can be anywhere. There's, there's new churches that are popped up at racing tracks. They've popped up at... Uh, like restaurants, Eagles Club tonight being the first Sunday. They're not calling this a fresh expression, but it's a lot like it. They're offering a free meal to anyone in the community, and at the end, there'll be just a word of faith, some type of word that can have a discussion. That's fresh expressions. And in my mind, it's a great way to have the honor to share about Jesus. Because even though we know Jesus, even though we know it's important to invite people to this great banquet of Christian living, we still need to have the privilege and the honor to invite them. And we want it to be real and authentic. So God saves. We don't have to. And become part of the story. 
And the third point, become comfortable with just being present. There has been times in my journey with disabilities, I guess is a good way of saying it, that like when I heard that I was losing my hearing and it was not gonna come back even though I went through the nasty shots in my ear <laughs> and all these other kind of things. And, and I knew that God could heal, but there was still this side of me, the practical side of me that wanted to hear people's voices, that wanted to still use my guide dog and walk down the street all by myself and be able to negotiate without other people having to do that. And I felt such a loss, I felt so vulnerable, and honestly, I was angry. And it was not pretty, and it was not fun to be with. And it was amazing to me, the people that came to see me, this was around the same time that I had my thyroid out with my cancer. They came to see me, and they just sat there. And they held my hand, they let me cry, they didn't say it's going to be okay. They were just there. Because in my mind, if they said they were, it was going to be okay, they probably <laughs> would have been yelled at or something. But the point is, be comfortable just being present. And that's not a gift for everybody. Ken is a wonderful fixer. And it's tough for him to just be present at times, but he has grown so much in that, and it's amazing to watch. I had the awesome privilege of being able to watch Ken usher his mom into glory land. We spent the last month that she was in hospice with her for several hours a day, and Ken was incredible. He was just there, and often there was no room in the he was, she was at a nursing home and there was no chair left in the room. So Ken would get down on the floor and he'd make himself comfortable. And then all of a sudden you'd hear his mom say, Kenneth. <laughs> and Ken would get right back up, yeah, ma. And then she'd have something silly like, I don't think my blanket's covering this or can you move this or, and you could tell she just wanted to know that somebody was there. Even though she had all of these other people around, she just, she needed to know that her son was present. And sometimes in that situation, it would be easy to anticipate what your mom might want. And you know, so you start grabbing for a cup of water or this or that, or just fix it without her asking. But instead, he was okay with being present and letting her run the narrative that, that time. And it, many of you, I'm sure, are already used to this with grandkids or just people that you've come across. But it's something to remember with even the people that we invite here or we invite to learn about Jesus. That sometimes it's not about our agenda, it's about just being there and God will work through that. And I think being quietly with somebody shows way so much respect for that person. I wanna close with an example. Ken shared this from a devotional that he had read. And it had to do with a suburban church and it was a fairly upper middle class type church. People were very dressed up and beautiful building. And this person that was homeless walked in and you could tell that he was homeless by his disheveled clothes and that he carried his bags with him. And he did not just walk in, he walked in, walked down the aisle and took a seat in front of the altar on the floor. Well, I'm sure there was a lot of whispering and moving and an uncomfortable tension and all of a sudden, this one older gentleman who used a cane, he got up and, you know, 
I'm sure too there was this anxiety like, uh-oh, what is that gentleman gonna say to him? Is he, you know, is he gonna like push him aside with his cane or is he gonna, but no, this gentleman who clearly he had mobility issues, he got up, he went to the front next to this other gentleman and he sat down next to him and service continued. Just be comfortable with being present. And as we live out this great banquet and we learn ourselves what God is asking us to do every day, we're also setting that example of how to love others like God loves us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you that your word today still teaches us so much. And we pray, Father God, that you show each one of us who we need to reach out to, whether it's to invite them to this fellowship or to sit down and, and just have a cup of coffee with them. Let us stay open to whatever you ask, Father God. In your son's name, amen.
thank you that you loved us enough to give us this way that we can be free of our sins and eventually go to heaven. Be with us today as we take communion and allow us to think of, again, how we can step out into this broken world. Pray all this in your son's name. Amen. I'm going to read from Matthew, verse 26, 26. During the meal, Jesus took some bread in his hands. He blessed the bread and broke it. Then he gave it to his disciples and said, Take this and eat it. This is my body. This is the bread that symbolizes Jesus' body, and it was broken for all of us. Take this bread and eat it in remembrance of Jesus. Now I'm going to read from Matthew 20, chapter 26, verse 27 and 28. Jesus picked up a cup of wine and gave thanks to God. He then gave it to his disciples and said, Take this and drink it. This is my blood, and with it God makes his agreement with you. It will be poured out so that many people will have their sins forgiven. This is the cup that symbolizes the wine, which stands for Jesus' blood that was poured out for you and me.
Amen. Please accept your benediction. Please rise. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Go in peace. Amen.